Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books at the Ohio County Public Library. We have a very special program for you today. Um, the presenter is Janet E. Kroon. She has a bachelor's degree in political science, modern European history, and Russian language and area studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana Campaign. Champagne, sorry. <laughs> and uh, a master's degree in international studies from the University of Dayton in Ohio. She taught international baccalaureate history for nearly two decades for Fairfax County Public Schools. And as you can see, the name of, of the book she has edited is gonna tell you about today is called The War Outside My Window. Here is Jan Crew. Hello, how are you? Okay. Let me start this and we'll get going. The picture here is the only image that we have of Leroy. Um, we think it was taken when he was maybe about 10 and uh, it is in the uh, archives in the Library of Congress as are all seven of his journals. I opened up a page and took a screenshot of one for you. You can see his beautiful handwriting and that was one of the joys of working with this is I have beautiful cursive handwriting to read. Um, this has been a, a project that has just been a delight for me. It's my first publication and I couldn't have asked for a more interesting, important piece of work. Um, the diaries were featured in a Washington Post article on Facebook and talked about a prized possession, a jewel in their collection. It was an article about the sesquicentennial of the opening of the Civil War, and the author just made it sound really, really important. And then he said it wasn't published. So I um, got in touch with a friend and Ted, Ted Savas, and we published it. But Leroy was born in 1847 into a prominent slaveholding family in Macon, Georgia. His father had in the 1840s been mayor of Macon twice. He was extremely important in the uh, manufacturing of cotton in Macon and um, in the First Presbyterian Church. It was, was a time where religion was highly important. Leroy kept a diary from 1860 to 1865, starting when he was 12, ending in seven, at age 17. And what's nice is that he wrote in it almost every single day. And that's kind of unique because a lot of Civil War era diaries don't give you this daily, you know, this is what we did every single day kind of glimpse. They, they will write about exciting things or um, something that important that happens, but not just the common everyday things. So you get really get a good glimpse of what daily life was like at that time. Now, Leroy was an invalid. That's one thing that, that um, the article in the Post had made, made clear. They did not know how he got sick. Um, they said that he had some sort of injury and he had bed sores. Um, I was able to find out what the what was uh, the truth behind that. But Leroy was incredibly smart. He was very, very bright. He was educated. He was kind. He was curious. He wanted to know all kinds of um, answers about all kinds of things. And as he grew older, he became more and more opinionated. Um, so we're looking at a very unique, bright kid here uh, who's giving him his, giving us his, his daily input into what's going on in making a large railroad cross, crossroads and letting us know how the war is impacting him, his family, and the society around him. Um, these are some pictures later in life of his parents. Uh, Mary Eliza Baxter was his mother. And we think this picture was taken later in life. It's definitely post-war. Um, this is John Jones Gresham, her husband. Um, and they're sitting on the front porch of their home on College Street, 353 College Street in Macon. It's known today as the 1842 Inn, which is when Gresham had the house built. And it is a bed and breakfast. And the people there are delighted when... Leroy's uh, fans come to, to take a look at the home. They're very welcoming. And if you ever get a chance to go to Macon, I strongly urge you to go and see it. I've sat in that spot and it was really kind of neat. 
Um, Gresham owned about 100 slaves on two plantations that were side by side, about 30 miles south and east of Macon in Houston County. Um, he called the places Pinewood, uh, Oakwood, and Pineland. And um, it was about a day's carriage ride between the plantations and the home in Macon. And like many of the, the wealthy in Macon, they lived in town and had um, people taking care of their, their plantations elsewhere. Um, this is a rare hand-colored daguerreotype, this next image I'm gonna show you, that I happened to get a hold of um, through one of John Gresham's brother's descendants. It was taken in the late 1840s. I'll just show it to you now. It's been enlarged. Um, the whole image is not this large. It's actually four women in it. The woman on the left is, we believe, Mary Gresham, about the age she would have had Leroy. So if you look at the facial structure in the two pictures, you can kind of see there's a resemblance. Uh, we have other pictures that we, we don't know who owns them, so we can't use them. Um, <clears throat> And we can really see the resemblance between them. We believe, or kind of like to think that the woman next to her is her own mother, Mary Ann Baxter, who lived in um, Athens, Georgia. And she plays an important role for uh, Leroy and his siblings. She's the only grandparent that the children had during the war. The other uh, grandparents had deceased already. So um, again, being hand colored makes this really unique. We didn't, I didn't show you the whole thing because the image is damaged. The other two women, you can just see that they're outlines of women, but you can't see who they are. So just focus on the two that we had a clear glimpse at. Hey, um, hey Jan, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the PowerPoint before we go on is not, it's not showing the whole slide. Oh. Um, we had that problem when we tested it. Maybe you could try changing your orientation, your uh, image size somehow. You were able to fix it last week. I just didn't want people to miss out on the images. Huh. Yeah, you. I can see it, you know, before you run the slideshow, but. Okay, I'm gonna try to make this larger. Okay, yeah, try that and I'll get out of here. There's the pictures on the side. Is this, does this work? Right. It, it looks fine there, but it, when you see see what happens when you run the slideshow. See now what happens when it gets big, it's going to do the same thing. So I can just go from here. All right, go from there. Thank you. I'm sorry. No problem. I want people to see these images and and see what I've got here. Um, so if this works, we'll just continue on from here. Um, so again, you get to see, hopefully now you get to see the the daguerreotype. Uh, I had friends on Facebook. I belong to a number of different Facebook groups. And uh, the, the one uh, that I want you to get information on clothing, um, I put this into the, it's a private group, put this image in there and said, can you, what can you tell me about it? And within 15 minutes, I had like 40 women telling me that it was 1840s and asked them why. And they described different aspects of the clothing, um, both of, of both women. Um, and then I checked with um, the um, editor of Military Images, who knows a lot about photography from the era, and he, he verified it as well. Um, the next slide I'm gonna show you has two other images. Um, and these are Minnie Gresham on the left, that's Leroy's younger sister, and his older brother, Thomas. Now, Thomas was born in 1844, and these two boys had an incredibly tight relationship. Their mother wrote in a letter um, that we have at the back of the book that they had a language that the two of them only could understand. Now that's not uncommon with twins as they grow older, but these boys were three years apart in age. So they had an incredibly unique relationship growing up. Minnie was the only daughter uh, she was also, it's, it's kind of a bonus in here. I think you're going to learn about Leroy, but you learn about both of his siblings as well. Um, Minnie was extremely well educated. She attended the first accredited all girls school in the United States, Wesleyan Female College, which is still in Macon. It's got new buildings now, but it's still there. And at that time, it was literally a block away from her home. Um, she wrote, um, 
her junior essay and presented it out loud. Now, for girls to be able to talk about any kind of serious subject in public in an auditorium, to be asked to do that meant that you were a very good scholar. And it was a high honor for many. And Leroy wrote all about it. And one thing I couldn't understand, though, was he talks about the exact time she starts, how long she spoke, how proud he was of her, and the fact that the um, family, the household slaves had all come to listen to their young lady recite. But Leroy was outside listening. And I didn't understand why. Why is he not in there? Now, he got around using a wagon, but I thought, it can't be that big. I mean, it's just like a regular um, special built for him wagon because he couldn't walk. But I couldn't understand why, and I'll be able to explain that to you later. Um, I was particularly excited to get this um, picture of uh, Thomas because Leroy describes in Jan January of 1864 um, when this picture was taken. He went with his mother and brother. He described how disappointed he was when he got the picture back, which was kind of interesting. But um, I just wanted to be able to get this because of the importance Leroy put on this particular image of Thomas in his uniform. Um, they had two other siblings, one on either side of Leroy. Edmund, who lived for seven months, he died of pneumonia. And we know this because um, the same family that had the daguerreotype in these two images had a letter from John to his brother Edmund, and these people are descendants of Edmund, uh, saying that his little namesake had died of complications from pneumonia. Edward was 17 months, and um, we have a lot of extant letters at the archives I have not been able to go through as of yet. So still don't know what happened to little Edward, but um, I will find out one of these days. But um, Minnie and, and Thomas are buried in Baltimore. Leroy, his parents, and the two little brothers are buried at Rose Hill in Macon. So you can even go and see the see that where they are in the cemeteries. And um, I kind of do that every time I go to Macon. It's like family for me now. But um, let's go to the next slide. Now we found out what happened to his leg, what caused the injury, because I started reading everything I could get on Macon in the 1850s and found the um, it's a real small memoir of a man named uh, Judge Ayers. And he wrote about this accident that happened while he was in school at the same school Leroy, excuse me, Leroy attended um, Mr. Bates's school across the street. And he said that they had found out that a building called the Washington Building had burned overnight in the uh, business part of town. Now, they, they all these people were wealthy and they lived up on the hill that overlooks Macon, which is um, right on the Okmulgee River. And so the boys decided after school that they were gonna walk down and take a look. And boys being boys, they started poking around in it. And Judge Ayers wrote that at one point he noticed that the only standing object, which was a brick um, fireplace chimney, had started to waver. It was moving back and forth. And he told all the boys, you got to run, it's going to fall. And he said the little boy standing next to him bore the, the worst of it. His left leg was crushed and he never um, was able to walk again and died shortly after the war. And that describes perfectly Leroy. So we know that his leg was crushed in 1856. By 1857, in letters that are in the archives, uh, we know he developed a, a persistent cough that would not go away. And he didn't have bed sores. He had back abscesses, is how his father described them in letters uh, by 1860. And so we're getting a little bit more information, but still not enough to put everything together as I was transcribing. Um, but the, the story begins with Leroy and his father going just the two of them, father and son journey, to see Dr. Joseph Pancos in Philadelphia in the summer of 1860. And Dr. Pancoast um, happened to be one of the most prominent physicians in the United States at that point. So John Gresham was sparing no, no money to help his son. And um, I learned that Dr. Pancoast was one of the first surgeons to practice what we now call plastic surgery. 
um, they went up to Philadelphia. Um, you can see on the screen, this is the opening of the that first small little journal of the set of seven. And um, Leroy wrote, like most 12 year olds write, very, very short, to the point, simple sentences. Um, we stayed in, in room 13. Father took me to see the um, Natural History Museums. They had skulls everywhere. It just the things like that um, that he wrote about. But what he also wrote is he was disappointed because Dr. Panko said that he could not help him. And he was very disappointed. And even later through the war years, um, Dr. Pankos had gone on to have prominent positions as a military surgeon. Um, Leroy mentions him and hopes that, wishes he could talk to him again because he knows Pankos can help him. Um, but the diary that he was given, it was again, a little pocket-sized diary, was a gift from his mother so that Leroy could um, let her know what, th what th kinds of things that they had done. Um, as a person who taught world history, I got very excited at one point and my publisher wanted to know why. And he, it's Leroy had, and his father took a short stop in New York, New York City, and Leroy talks about Japanese people. Oh, he was witnessing the first delegation of Japanese to come to the East Coast of the United States ever. And so um, I was able to get a footnote about that in the book because I thought that was interesting that he's seeing this very important event um, for the first time. Every so often we'd have a little tussle about the footnotes, but I was able to get that one in. Um, his personality, again, this kid was really well-educated. He spoke Latin, um, also to the point where he played with words in Latin. Uh, he read everything everything could get his hands on. He is reading Shakespeare and enjoying it at 12 and 13 years of age. Um, he is reading the serialization of Les Miserables um, by Victor Hugo, the, which is how it came out. It came out in different sections. And he is very excited to get a hold of the new one and able to read that. Uh, he loved mathematics. It got to the point later on where he was working at a level that was even beyond Mr. Bates, school teacher, and the only two people that can ha help him are his brother and another young man named um, um, named Jim Campbell, who was a, ended up being a major in the Civil War, and he would also play chess with Jim. He loved science, especially astronomy, so you get a sense of all of these as you're reading through his diaries. He's inquisitive, talkative, sweet, funny, kind. He doesn't have a bad word to say about anybody. Not even there's not even a hint of sibling rivalry in there. Um, and he loved pets. He seemed to have a good relationship with everyone. Um, his pets. He had a whole series of dogs named after Confederate generals. Uh, he's opinionated. Uh, he had an opinion about just about everything including Thomas's photo that I showed you, which he didn't like. Um, and he says some things that are kind of uh, reminiscent of Mark Twain, who was a contemporary, but um, the words across the page 14 here, little scribbles, looks like a, a small child scribbling. We figure it could be either Florence, who was at this point five years old. She was actually born the same day Leroy had his leg accident. Um, she would have been five. She's the daughter of one of the housemates, but she would have known, excuse me, she would have known not to write in Mr. Leroy's book. So we think it was his little cousin, Tracy, who would have been two years old. Uh, his mother died before he was a year old and his father went, he was a surgeon um, in, the, in the Confederate army for Georgia as well. But on top of the scribbles, Leroy writes, some jackass goddess got hold of this book and tried his hand at writing. So you see these kinds of things in the margin that are really amusing and little things he says that just, they make you laugh out loud. They really do. So he's got a great sense of humor. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Okay, the question family social life. This is one of the unique things about um, the diary that, that really it makes it important. Um, not just the, you know, the, the humor in it and um, 
learning about his life, but he describes the food, the clothing, the many conversations that people have when they come to the home, the interactions between different people. Um, he'll, he'll talk about the conversations he had with some of the slaves that work in the house, um, the important people who come into the home. I'll, I'll show you one later between Leroy and the newspaper publisher in town. And there's a whole stream of visitors, which gets to be really interesting as well. His father was, um, again, an elder in the Presbyterian church, and they would have meetings every year called presbyteries, and they would hold them in different cities in Georgia. And one year, the meetings were in Macon, and a minister um, by the name of um, Thomas Wilson came to the home, and I wanted to put a footnote in about that. And, and Ted was very reluctant. And he goes, well, who is that? And I said, that's Woodrow Wilson's father. Woodrow Wilson was born in Virginia, but his father was a, a Presbyterian minister and went and um, had a a, a a church that he preached at in Augusta, Augusta, Georgia. And so he came, he's in the house. And uh, later on, um, long after the war was over, actually, it was one of the last things that Gresham, John Gresham did before he died, was he got one of Minnie's best friends a government position um, in the um, uh, Bureau of Records. And she, she was a statistician for the federal government looking at the impact of work on women and children. And that would probably could have been done through um, somebody like Wilson or somebody up there. So they had a lot of very important connections. Military people come into the house. It's it's very, very interesting. So you follow this family from the peak of their influence in 1860, all the way down to not knowing if they're going to have a home. They, they think that they may have to leave their home in Macon at one point during the war. Leroy doesn't know where they're gonna be the next Christmas. There's a lot of questions that these formerly very secure people had. So you get to watch all of that as it plays out as well. And again, this is one of the important aspects of the book. Not many diaries give us this. Um, and the book also includes a list of biographies of major people in Leroy's life. Um, I did extensive work on ancestry because for me, I needed to know who all of these Marys and Elizabeths and other people were in his life. And some of the, the nicknames were kind of interesting. When I found Cousin Link, I thought, oh, my goodness, I've, I've really gotten ex an exciting piece of information. Um, it was the nickname, and I, I came across it. And I have 1,701 individuals on my Ancestry.com family tree. We can trace it to all sorts of prominent people in Georgia as well that were kind of um, distant, distant cousins so many times removed. So um, politics, uh, Leroy follows secession. He follows the politics of it. Um, he loves Confederate President Jefferson Davis. He is well aware of his, um, his record during the Mexican War and his record as a uh, congressman for Mississippi and also as secretary of war shortly before the war. Um, his support wanes towards the end. Um, he, he starts to realize that Jefferson Davis is not making some of his decisions looking for the best of war, but playing favorites. And, and he realizes this and mentions that um, Governor Joe Brown is somebody that uh, Leroy just never liked. Uh, he didn't like him at the very beginning. And I think it was because Joe Brown had been such a staple in Georgia politics. They elected their governors every other year. And Joe Brown at the start of the war had already had two terms. And he is elected for a third time and then a fourth. And Leroy says that this is a total embarrassment because, you know, if somebody else should allow dictator Joe Brown um, to have a, a chance at governing Georgia. I used the term dictator, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Leroy is young, so you can kind of hear the echoes of his father's politics. Like a lot of the students I had in ninth grade during uh, an election year, what you heard from them was basically what they heard at home. But when I would get those same kids back in 12th grade, they're making their own decisions. And Leroy does that as well. He um, 
starts to disagree with his, his father and he's very reluctant to do that even in the pages of his diary, which is interesting. So you can see the kind of very close relationship he had with his father. Um, he mocks Lincoln and Northern soldiers, which is common. Um, there was one excerpt um, that I find amusing, it happened in Fairfax, Virginia, which is very, very close to me. And he talks about the first clash between the two sides, just kind of an overnight push by the union into Fairfax courthouse, as it was called then. And he said now that uh, based on the reports, he knows how the, the union is building an army. They're kicking all of the drunks out of saloons, giving them guns and setting them loose on the women and children of Fairfax courthouse, which totally wasn't true, but that's the kind of misinformation that one gets during a war. And that's true of just about any war. Um, the Civil War itself, again, what it, what is so revealing about this is not only does he understand the politics at a very young age, but he follows, sorry about the cattail there, he follows every single battle of the war. It doesn't matter if it's <clears throat> Army of Northern Virginia, if it's along the uh, Atlantic coast with the Navy, if it's up the Mississippi or if it's the Trans-Mississippi Theater, he follows every single bit of it. And um, that again is really important because even if you know nothing about the Civil War, you can follow it because you're learning right along with Leroy and it's chronological. A lot of students think the only part of the Civil War was between Lee and Grant. And there's a whole lot more to this conflict than just the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac. Um, so every battle that he talks about, I footnote it so you can follow it. Um, the one that I, the, the clip of here, he calls the Battle of Richmond and he's giving a, an overview of it. Um, there was no Battle of Richmond. You won't find that in, um, in academic works. He's talking about the Seven Days Campaign of 1860, um, 1862. So that's why I gave you footnotes. Um, some of them he calls by different names. For example, Battle of Balls Bluff, which was less than five miles from here. Um, he calls the Battle of Leesburg. And again, you won't find a Battle of Leesburg, <clears throat> but you will find a lot about the Battle of Balls Bluff. That was a um, really interesting battle there. He's interested in how Georgia troops were doing. Um, Macon becomes a, a training camp for the war, uh, again, because it's at railroad crossroads for about five different rail lines. Um, they come to Macon, they, they turn the um, racetrack into a training ground. Um, you also see different public buildings being taken over to be used as hospitals at different points of the war. And you see a lot of, um, communication about the generals. He has a lot of respect and love for Robert E. Lee. Um, General Joe Johnston is also um, someone that Leroy talks about frequently. You see mood swings though, as the South wins and loses battles. And um, the battle at um, Vicksburg is one that really shows how the news was really able to influence the people's moods. And of course he covers Sherman and the Georgia campaign. Um, Bacon is touched by the war on a couple of occasions. I won't tell you all of it, but, uh, cause that'll spoil the reading. But Leroy did see some fighting from the roof of his house. He was able to get up there. Um, he had to have help to get up on the roof, but he was able to watch the cannon um, firing on the other side of the Okamongi and watch the cannonballs go flying over into town. Um, there's only one one building, one civilian building that was damaged during the war, the Cannonball House. And um, he describes how that happened. That's another place you can go and make it um, and just see this lovely antebellum home. And they tell you the story of how the Cannonball flew in through the front window as the lady of the house was walking down the stairs. Um, so it's, it's just the insight is really incredible here. Processing the news is something that... Um, <clears throat> We didn't expect really, but this is a really important aspect of the war. And today we are so used to having everything at, you know, in the palm of our hands. 
if anything happens across the world, we know it almost instantaneously. Um, even the Gulf War um, and, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, you can watch them almost as they're happening. Um, but this wasn't true then. News took a very long time, even though they had a telegraph. Um, it took a while to get where it was. And he learns really quickly that not everything he reads is true. Um, his hopes get high and are often dashed. Um, he'll talk about, okay, I have to wait until the, the official report comes out. He learns that there's such a thing as fake news. It's not a new concept. We just look at it a little bit differently today. And he learns to question the news. As he gets older, he, he questions things more. It shows his maturation process. Um, the one piece of news that, that is up here that I've got for you, it says Grant's losses, is actually a, a piece of newspaper from the North. If Mr. Clisby, he was the um, um, editor of the, the, um, the Macon newspaper, if he didn't have enough to fill his pages, he'd look and see what the Yankees had printed. And you hear that all the time, publishing each other's news as it came through. Um, which again is really interesting to publish directly what the enemy had to say. Um, but the clip I have here shows real insight. Um, it's Tuesday, July 7th, 1863. And Leroy talks about Mr. Clisby coming over. <clears throat> Everybody knows that Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia have crossed the Potomac for the second time and they're waiting for news, they're waiting for anything to happen. And Leroy asks him, has anything happened? Do you know anything? And Mr. Clisby says, well, yes. Um, there's been some fighting in a, a little town in Pennsylvania, but as Leroy writes in his journal, Mr. Clisby thinks it was not a large affair. He's talking about the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is four days after the battle is over. And the telegraph reports have not gotten down to Macon yet. They don't know that it was a major disaster, loss of life for both sides. Um, it's considered a Confederate loss because Lee retreats, he goes back to Virginia. And then after this, you get a steady stream of Leroy recording the um, Battle of Gettysburg and the aftermath. Um, he even writes almost like a little essay, um, giving just a, a final overview of the whole thing. It's stuck in uh, on a piece of blue paper, loose in the, the journals. Um, of course, slavery is a part of this story, but for Leroy and his family, it wasn't anything unique. Uh, it was just some everyday matter of life, fact, life thing. Um, again, they had 93 slaves on the plantations that they had in, in Houston. I went through the, um, Archi the, uh, the archives, the census for 1860, there are two different books that census takers kept from Schedule A, which was white people and free blacks and Schedule B, which were slaves. They were um, organized based on the owner's name and the overseer of the place. And they kept account of how many people there were, their ages, their genders and their degree of color. Uh, they might be black in Virginia. They used FB as a um, notation, full black, which means they were very dark, um, but no names and no skills. And a lot of these people had very specific skills. You had people that could work on iron. You had skilled carpenters who would come up to the making household and help. Um, you had a lot of, of, of even the women, uh, Julia Ann, and he wrote his name. Her name with such affection here that I clipped it out. Um, she was a skilled seamstress. And a lot of these people, again, they, they, they were trained. They had things that they could do. Um, based on what Leroy wrote, we um, surmise that the slaves in the Gresham family knew how to read and write because they got letters back and forth from servants in the grandmother's household, um, which is very unique. Um, it was not legal in many places to teach your slaves how to read or write. He mentions them by name, even the ones that are not up there daily. He gets very concerned for some of the men that are conscripted by the government to uh, work on the um, battlements outside of Savannah. There's seven of them that um, John Gresham sends 
And Leroy is very concerned because they all came back sick, one of them extremely sick. Um, he talks about how one of the, the housemaids was sent off in the middle of the night down to the plantations. And he doesn't know for a few days why she had to leave so quickly in the middle of the night. And it was because her sister was dying. And the Greshams wanted her to be able to get down to say goodbye to her sister before she passed. Um, he describes how plantation crops supported the family home. Uh, one thing that he kept track of, besides the price of berries and apples and sugar and flour, was how much pork was slaughtered every year by, by the pounds. Um, that was an important way to um, have a way to barter and, and have some sort of um, money when the Confederate um, currency got so highly inflated. People could use um, pork or bacon to try and trade for things. And um, he describes some of that in the book with his, his father in the uh, his cotton mill. Um, so he doesn't talk about slavery as being a good thing or a bad thing. It just was. Um, it's rem important to remember that they were born into this life. And in one letter um, from from John to um, his wife, he writes about how difficult the planting season was. He was down there on a horse going through the fields. He was having a hard time and he felt so bad for the slaves because they were working in the same fields and they weren't on a horse and it was next to impossible for them to move in all the mud. And he writes, "I almost makes me wish I didn't own a slave. And the unwritten part you can kind of hear is, I don't know what I would do otherwise. This is what I know. Um, <clears throat> the pictures that I have here are stock pictures. And I didn't realize it until somebody pointed it out to me. But in the group picture on the bottom, the woman holding what looks like a hat or a bowl on the very left is, um, um, I'm blanking on her name now. Isn't that embarrassing? Uh, Harriet Tubman in her younger years. Um, I just wanted to give you kind of a sense of, of what they were. They're not family pictures. I wish I had some family pictures. Um, I am trying to figure out what happened to some of the people that worked for the Greshams um, after the war, but haven't had much luck in doing that. Uh, we do know, and you get a really good sense that this kid is really sick. Um, he talks about his, his leg quite frequently, the constant pain he had. Um, and then the abscesses on his back and the coughing and the other injuries that he has. And as I, I took a clip of it, he writes, saw off my leg a couple of times, um, especially when he's much younger. Um, by the end of transcription, I didn't know what disease killed him because Leroy didn't know. His parents chose not to tell him that he was terminally ill. And I found out, um, because the way we figured this out is, is Ted Savas, my publisher, who got very involved in this book. Um, you just end up loving this, this young man. Um, one of his other authors is a um, Johns Hopkins trained surgeon. And he had me pull out the medical parts of the book. And we sent it off to, um, to this doctor. And he was able to give us a lot of information within about two weeks. Um, found out that about 70% of people in the United States at the time of the Civil War had the disease that killed Leroy in their bodies. But because they were normally healthy, they were able to suppress it and it was never a problem. Leroy was terminally ill with tuberculosis. It's a form of TB I'd never heard of. It's called POTS disease. Um, it still exists today in some parts of the third world. We don't see it here because generally we get inoculated against tuberculosis. Um, and so we don't have people who are far away from medication or they can't afford a doctor. Um, and that's why people in the third world will get it. Um, one of my own physicians has talked to me about that. But what it was was uh, spinal tuberculosis and the disease was eating its way through Leroy's body and coming out on either side of his spine. And he will describe in great detail what it looked like, what it felt like. Um, he wrote about 
the symptoms, the remedies, the stuff this kid took is just phenomenal. Some of it was quite poisonous. Um, he talked about the treatment in great detail. Um, even when he had to have the sores lanced, um, this kid was taking an incredible amount of opium, uh, morphine. He was drinking alcohol on top of it. And remember, this was a time where drinking alcohol was not a big deal. Um, so he had his own cache of Catawba wine in the house. Uh, he would drink porter beer at bedtime, probably helped him relax and get some sleep. He's, he doesn't have a good um, sleep history. Um, but we found out from doctor, um, the doctor that helped us that this is the only detailed tuberculosis account of a patient in the 19th century describing the illness and he doesn't know he has TB. So this is an important document for people studying medicine as well, to study with an unbiased way. I mean, Leroy's not looking for milestones, like, oh, now um, this has happened to me, I've only got six months to live. He doesn't know any of that. Um, and basically what is happening here, um, these are is a, a diagram that I took from Potts' work of what happened to the bones in spinal um, tuberculosis. The bone is eroded, starts to collapse in on himself, itself, which is why he starts having pain in his legs and starts losing control over his ability to, to move his legs. Um, you can also see the curvature in here. Again, this is from Potts' um, publication. Um, there's a parallel decline here, which is, is really kind of interesting. I, I talked to a Civil War Roundtable in Northern Ohio um, a year ago. And one of the gentlemen at the end, he said, you know, Shakespeare couldn't have written a more perfect tragedy. And he really couldn't because the parallels are just, just striking. Um, the eventual Southern defeat depresses Leroy and he notices this. He knows it's over um, about six months before the end of the war. And he writes about, he doesn't know what's gonna happen next. Um, as 1865 arrives, he starts to take more morphine. He grew weaker. The pain he describes is horrendous. Um, even though he's trying to figure out what he's going to do with the rest of his life, um, he became increasingly involved as his good leg became drying up, is how he put it. Uh, journaling took his mind off of the disease. And the handwriting in his journal began to change, strikingly so. Um, I noticed um, after about the 22nd, 23rd of May, none of the um, entries are in Leroy's handwriting. And going through a bunch of other letters, this one down here included, which is transcribed in the book, um, his mother's taking dictation for him. He no longer can even write in his own journal, but it's so important and keeps his mind off of things that. Um, she takes dictation, basically. The last entry is June 8, 1865, and it's just three words. I am, and then a very smudged word, which we were able to use modern technology and find out that it was the word I am, perhaps. And then whatever he said after that, Mary couldn't write. She did, however, leave us a seven-page letter to her only sister, describing Leroy's final hours, the fact that he was able to have um, a, some time without any pain. Um, he only gets angry once. Um, and that's when he, he gets mad at his mother for not telling him that he was dying. And he's upset because he wanted to give away his personal effects by himself in person. And he couldn't do that because there wasn't enough time left. Um, she describes his burial in great detail as well. And basically, Leroy is chronicling the decline of the Old South, which parallels his own decline in death. Um, he dies on June 18, 1865, um, shortly after the war was over. It's still kind of going on in a few parts in the West, but basically it's done. Um, this letter here, um, it's part of the postscript, and it's heartbreaking. Have some tissues when you read it because it is incredibly sad. His gift to history. Um, it's the only teenage non-male combatant account of the Civil War. I've done a lot of reading on the war and I like reading primary sources, um, but all the ones of the people who were in the war um, 
other ones by men, they were, they saw a battle. Leroy's the only one who didn't. It's the only insider view of a prominent Southern family on a day-to-day -day basis during the Civil War. Again, if you've read Mary Chestnut's book, she's a little bit uh, different because she's hobnobbing with Jefferson Davis's family. Uh, she gets to know John Bell Hood extremely well. Hers isn't a quote unquote normal existence. Um, it's the only detail during the world on the course and treatment of TB in the 19th century. Dr. Rosbach, who helped us with the diagnosis, wrote a companion piece that goes into more detail about the medications, why they were used, um, what kinds of treatments Leroy went through, what other treatments they had, and basically a history of um, tuberculosis and what was understood about TB in the, the 19th century. And when I first started this, um, my publisher asked me to um, look at other diaries and find something close. And like, as I said, I couldn't. And, and at the end he goes, well, did you do your homework? And I said, well, the teacher always does her homework. And he said, what was your conclusion? I said, well, the only thing that comes close to this is the diary of Anne Frank. And uh, we had to get on the phone at that point because he wanted a good explanation of that. And I said, well, obviously there's differences. And Anne Frank died as a result of the Holocaust. She was being persecuted for her religious beliefs um, by a, an outside government, it was government policy. Um, and they hid away from the world in the attic in Amsterdam. Leroy, his story is a bit different. He's, he, he doesn't even know what his nemesis is. It's the tuberculosis. They're both describing a world in a major conflict, describing for you how their day-to-day -day life changes, how the world is changing. Um, He's talking about uh, his illness as, along with the war. Um, but again, his is the voice of the young co Southern Confederacy and what that was like. It's a really, really unique um, kind of book. So um, that is pretty much my presentation. And... Let me get out of this. Looks like my camera was unplugged. I don't know what that was, but I am still here. I can answer questions. Um, yes, yes, we can hear you, but we can I'm gonna stop and see if anyone has a question and I'll, I'll go back off and we'll see what happens. Okay, great. great. Just so you can hear me, you don't need to look at me. <laughs> okay, does anyone have a question for Jan about the book? Jan, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Oh, here's a question. Let me flash it up. You can see. Okay. Oh, that that's an interesting question, um, Elizabeth. Um, we started work on this in May of um, 2017. Um, I had retired for medical reasons from Fairfax County, and I was at home, and I was bored, and this just came across Facebook, and just dropped into my lap. Um, we ended up publishing and presenting the book at, in Leroy's home on June 8th, um, eight, uh, 2018. So it took a little bit over a year. And my publisher said it, he didn't expect me to get it done that quickly, especially when you consider I had Achilles tendon surgery in the middle of it all. Um, but uh, I was used to working with um, kid writing and I had beautiful handwriting to work with and um we were just able to get it done once i got started it was just a delight you, you have to keep going so it, it didn't take as long as we expected okay any other questions um one other thing that um thank you <laughs> um the diaries in the picture of leroy are housed in the library of congress 
they had, uh, thank you, Carol, they had um, digitized the whole collection. So I was able to work on my laptop, which was good. I've not actually seen them myself. But what we think is, is that um, after Leroy passed, he wanted his sister, uh, Minnie, to have the, the diaries because it was through her family that it was gifted to the Library of Congress. So we do know that. Um, she ended up going to a college outside of Baltimore or in Baltimore uh, after the war. That's where she met her husband and that's where she ended up living. And um, Thomas and his second wife are, are buried out there as well. His first wife, um, he had two children with and Thomas's first wife died of tuberculosis and is buried in the Gresham plot. So it's uh, any passages that remained illegible. There's only a few that I had to put illegible, you know, with the, you know, brackets in the book. His handwriting is so very clear. Um, and what we what I would do is if I had something that I couldn't read, um, I would move on and then come back. And usually with fresh eyes, you can uh, decipher it. Um, sometimes it was just, it was smudged and I couldn't read through the smudge, but there's, there's very little that was left out because of not being able to read. Um, it was a delight to have that. <laughs> okay. I, I did want to mention that the publisher is offering a 20% discount as you see on the screen. Savaspady.com and then enter virtual all caps when you're prompted and you'll get the discount. Um, any other questions before we sign off today? We'll give them a minute. Oh, let's see something else I forgot to put up. Here's the library of Congress uh, address so that you can see the material Jan was referring to. And um, we want to thank Jan again for an excellent presentation. Um, Thank sure. you. It's been a delight to, to be here for you. I'm sorry that the the picture went out. I have no idea what happened. The cat wasn't anywhere near it. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen. We persist and, you know, they could hear you. So it's all good. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again. And I just want to remind people that this Thursday evening, we have our uh, Geography B, which is the summer reading finale. Dr. Javersack will be hosting. Uh, you can win a gift certificate to a local restaurant. Uh, the first top three finishers, you, there will be scoring. And it'll be all about the countries we visited in our around the world in literature and language. Here's another comment. Oh, thank you, Aaron. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. I, I, I could talk about Leroy all the time. My younger daughter is, is 30 years old, lives in Cincinnati. So um, she says Leroy is the third child I never had. <laughs> well, it was uh, it was delightful. Thank you, Jan, and thanks everyone for attending today. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.